Perfect. I think we have almost everyone in from the waiting room. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on which time zone you're in, or good evening, I guess, even if you're abroad. Um, my name is Dr. Megan Rabarczyk. Um, I am currently the program director for the University of Pennsylvania um, Global Emergency Medicine Fellowship, um, and I am also the chair of the Global Emergency Medicine Fellowship Consortium, which is a committee of GEMA. Uh, thank you so much for joining for this webinar today. This is the first one we've been doing uh, as the GEMFC, um, and a huge thank you to SAM and GEMA for sponsoring this um, and for organizing it for the day. Um, so without further ado, I think let's go ahead and get started. The way that we've set things up today are that we're going to have um, three speakers here at the beginning, just to kind of give a little bit of an overview of why fellowship, um, the different types of fellowships that are out there, fellowship pathways, um, and then how you could best prepare for those of you who are medical students and, and residents, um, how you can best prepare if you want to think about uh, being competitive for, um, for fellowship uh, in the future. So. Uh, I think with that, we'll go ahead and get started with our first speaker, um, Dr. Naz Kareem. Dr. Kareem, take it away. Thanks, Megan, appreciate it. Um, hi guys, my name is Naz Kareem. I am the director of the Brown Global Emergency Medicine Fellowship. And this is a really quick overview of the pros and cons about why you should get into a fellowship or why you should choose one. Um, and it's going to be really short and sweet because it's five minutes, so I'm gonna get started. Um, so I really just wanted to know if you guys have put in the chat, um, how many of you are residents or medical students? Um, and that just is a way for me to, and for us to know as panelists, how to kind of gear the conversation once we get to the Q and A, um, and I can kind of gear the talk and, and answers to that as well. Because if you're a medical student versus a resident, your choices and options and the way you think about fellowship might be very different. Um, so let us know that. Let me see. Um, well, so I did want to start with when I was little, I did not know that I was going to be, you know, taking this path. Um, I didn't think about a global fellowship when I was younger, let alone medical school. And so many of you may not know what it is exactly you want to do, and that's okay. And that's kind of what we're here to answer. So when I was in medical school, the, you know, there were many options. There were many paths to take. Um, it was going to be a difficult road. I didn't exactly know what to do. So what I started off with was climbing Kilimanjaro when I was in medical school. And what I learned on that mountain was that there were several injuries. And when the injuries occurred as you're climbing, I learned that the resources were very limited. And that was my first taste of practicing medicine or watching medicine being practiced without having the proper tools and lack of access to emergency care because the nearest hospital was hundreds of miles away. And so that got me thinking, okay, I want to do something global. Um, and so I got involved in um, working with the tribe in Tanzania and just fell in love with this. And we would triage and then administer medicine, um, check blood pressure. But you can see this little girl in the middle who I'll never forget when she first, you know, listened to my heartbeat and it changed my world. And that's what I realized that that's what makes me tick. And I wanted to pursue global emergency medicine. But what is global health, right? Like what is global emergency medicine? For if you're medical students, you might not know what it involves in the global field. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the definition is providing high quality, culturally competent emergency care, education, research, leadership, in resource limited settings across the globe. So you see these different components. There's emergency care, working clinically, there's education, there's research, and there's leadership. And there's different ways to go about this. You can do a fellowship. And there are certain pros and components of a fellowship that are very beneficial and others will choose to go on it on their own. And it really just depends on what type of person you are and whether you think that the pros that I present today are really going to be beneficial to your future career. So let's talk quickly about that. Some of the pros of a fellowship are one, the education. So when I talk about education, you are learning as a fellow, but you're also teaching others. So what is it that you learn in a fellowship? There are opportunities to take um, courses such as the HELP course, which is the um, Humanitarian Emergencies and Large Populations course, teaches you about 
humanitarian relief and disaster relief, as well as mass ca casualties. There are um, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, which is another humanitarian course. Um, at Brown, there's multiple naval and civil and naval um, war classes that talk about disaster relief as well. Um, you can have, and many fellowships offer this, which is a formal degree of an MPH or a degree in translational research. And different programs will offer different formal degrees. Some will, for those of you who might have an MPH already, um, you could take the uh, Diploma in Tropical Hygiene, um, which is offered in various countries. And so there are these different educational components and that's where you can learn from the fellowship. You might have a curriculum at your institution um, where there are global conferences. You can take part in national um, journal clubs that is offered through Johns Hopkins, which is um, actually a collaboration between multiple universities. Um, Brown has a, a national didactic series. So there's lots of things that it's more of a formal education for you. Whereas the con is that you may not want that formal degree. Um, you may not uh, want to, you may want to go at it alone and do courses on your own, not necessarily have like an MPH or an MHA or anything else. Um, and that's okay. It just depends on what is it that you want, something more structured or something that you might have to do on your own. Um, for me, that was definitely, I needed structure and um, it was extremely helpful because the MPH allowed me to get um, a basic understanding of statistics or advance your knowledge in statistics and allow you to do the research that you need to do, which is important because that brings me to number two, which is getting time and money to work globally. When you do research in global emergency medicine fellowships, and you go on as a faculty member, you realize that the research is what brings in the money to let you work globally and gives you the time off and buys your time down so that you can work globally. Otherwise, a lot of divisions are usually not going to just offer you um, time down or money to travel. And that's super important if that's what you want to do. Um, it's really kind of hard to navigate that path on your own. It's not impossible, but it's it's a lot easier, I think, um, when you do it through research and a fellowship. Um, I did actually miss the teaching. You are have the opportunity in education to teach others. Um, so while you are learning core skills, you can also go abroad and teach at global emergency medicine residencies or the BEC course, for example, which is a basic emergency care course offered through WHO. It's an open access education forum and you can teach others to be trainers um, and create sustainable programs like that. So education is learning and teaching others, um, realizing that if you get a formal degree and you conduct research, that that allows you to get time and money down to work globally. Um, but on the other hand, you see the con, which is that you get paid as a PGY. Um, to be honest, for a lot of people, that's not a true con is what I'm going to argue with the cons that I have listed because um, you are getting paid more as a resident, which I was completely fine with. Um, and a lot of these rates are actually very competitive um, at Brown and at other institutions throughout the U.S. Uh, you know, you get paid almost $100,000 a year, um, which is phenomenal. And you also have the opportunity is if you are a fellow at an institution, um, your chair knows how you work clinically, how you work with others. Um, and I think there's a greater opportunity to get hired at your institution. So I think there's a little bit of actually job security there. So it might sound like a con that it's less pay than faculty member, but I think it's a pro because you have more time to work globally you have the money to work globally, and then you might get hired at that institution if you do well. But the most important thing I can say about fellowship is learning about your passion. Um, there's so many things that you can do globally. 
uh, whether it's road safety, infrastructure, public health, development, um, policy making, pediatrics, if you're pediatric EM. Uh, fellowship is really your opportunity to learn what is it that makes you tick and makes you get up in the morning. Um, and you can work on all different aspects of global EM, which Michelle will probably get into, that there are different um, opportunities in clinical care, public health, systems development, research, and so on, as well as humanitarian disaster relief, which is not on here. Um, but you do have to be the type of person that is able to work clinically um, in limited resources and can withstand limited supplies, be flexible and culturally adaptable, um, enjoy the teaching and learning that comes from uh, opportunities like this and work in all sorts of setting, whether it's pre-hospital care or education or simulation training. And in the end, you might have a research product as well. Um, some people think that's a pro. Some people think it's a con. I think if you're uncomfortable with research, uh, fellowship is a great way to get comfortable with that. Because again, that is what eventually brings your time and money um, to travel abroad. I would say the last thing is about pros versus cons is it's an unbelievable experience for me. It was as a fellow and I had the opportunity to network with others. Um, whereas fellowship may not be for you if you wanna create your own path. But the most important thing I think and the biggest pearl from what I wanna say in the short time is to get involved. Um, networking is super important. One of the biggest pros about, if you're thinking about a fellowship, it's because you also want to network and get to know who the global community is. And the way to do that is to get involved with groups like this, SAEM, GMA. Um, there is multiple groups that are listed here, um, including EMRA International, um, WHO and ICRC groups, which you come to know through the fellowship. Um, and I think that's extremely important, will help uh, prosper and help you grow in your global fellow career. But if you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, here is my email address and Twitter account. Um, but I hope this was like really short and sweet on why you should join a fellowship, but gave you an insight into true uh, cons as well. And Michelle is going to talk next about the different fellowships that are available um, and different pathways that you can take. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Naz. Um that was a great overview of kind of what you can get from fellowship. I'm going to talk a bit about the um, kind of how the fellowships are often structured. And the big theme of this is going to be that there's a lot of variability to that. Um, and that's really important when you're looking into the different fellowship options, what um, to kind of think about the different areas that Nas talked about. Um, and use that to guide what programs you look at um, and kind of how you think about your fellowship opportunities. Um, many fellowships, like pretty much all fellowships are one or two years. Some programs will limit it to being only one or only two, but a lot will have the flexibility of one or two years. Uh, some of that comes with um, the expectation of getting an advanced degree if you don't already have one. So many of the two-year programs will expect you to get an advanced degree. I think MPH is the most common, uh, and that's the one that I think a lot of fellowships are um, already set up to provide um, to like get people in contact with them and like have the structure in place to do the MPH. But some fellowships will actually make it easy to get, um, make it okay to get another degree. So for instance, I got a master's in academic medicine, so a medical education degree as part of my fellowship, um, but not all programs will do that. And so figuring out what kind of degree you might want, um, if you do want the degree, can help guide you to the program so it'll uh, let you have that flexibility to pick something else. Some fellowships, depending on their structure, like their clinical structure, may also require uh, applicants to be from a four-year program or have done three years plus extra clinical time, um, either in uh, working, um, like working as an attending or having switched from another specialty, something where you get a more PGY time. Um, and that's often just like a departmental rule. It's not 
an ACGME rule. It's usually something where the department has decided that um, the way that their shifts are structured makes it hard for somebody that graduated from a three-year uh, residency and is now a PGY-4 to supervise PGY-4s. Um, so it just depends on the structure um, of that fellowship, uh, of that department. Um, and that's something that the fellowships will usually write explicitly on their like information pages. Like they'll say what the requirements are uh, for the application. Uh, as Nana said, the salary can vary widely. Um, it usually starts as a PGY. Um, some uh, programs, often the higher cost of living programs will have something that's a little bit higher. Um, but a lot of fellowships will often will also have the opportunity for you to moonlight um, either internally or externally. Uh, some of that can be difficult if you're also doing an advanced degree. It can be really hard to get the time to travel abroad, do a degree and pick up extra shifts at another institution, another hospital, like a community site or something that can uh, I found it impossible. Um, but if you're not doing that advanced degree, sometimes that's doable. Um, for the advanced degrees, they can also be paid for by the department. Um, so that's something that's important to ask. Um, most of the time, they'll have like a set amount that they'll say, this is the amount that we can put for it. Um, or they'll have, or they'll say like, this is the program that we cover. So this particular MPH, we have the structure in place for that. One important thing to think about when you're considering the fellowship is remembering that this is protected time. Um, so you are going to be working shifts clinically, so you're still going to be figuring out how to be an attending if you're coming straight out of residency, but you're not working the full-time clinical load as a regular faculty member. So for uh, Stanford, that's 14 shifts a month um, would be full-time clinical load for our faculty. Our fellows do eight shifts a month, for instance. There's Often expected research component. Um, the type of that will vary depending on the program. Um, and then there's also going to be the expectation that you um, kind of expectation and also benefit that they want you to go to the conferences that Miles was talking about. That this is how you make your networking, how you make the contacts that will last you beyond your fellowship. The other thing to think about when you're looking at the different fellowship types is what does that global EM group do? Um, so who are the other faculty that are in that department and what kind of work do they do? What kind of work has the department done in the past? Where have they worked in the past? Um, every group is different. Some groups are gonna focus primarily on one, one or two sites and that's where all of the work is. Some groups are gonna be spread out a lot more and have a faculty member that works in one country and then another person works in another country and another person works on a totally different continent. Um, that is highly variable. The themes of the department tend to be consistent though. So one group will be, um, like most groups will focus on kind of different areas uh, within, that, within global emergency medicine. So capacity building or system strengthening is like a big one. Um, so that covers medical education. So that's setting up, um, residency programs, uh, training programs for uh, general practitioners that are staffing emergency departments or really more a and um, It'll include um, education of nurses or EMS, um, setting up EMS systems, um, setting up training EMTs. It can include uh, setting up triage systems and like uh, referral systems. So between different hospital groups, um, those are just some of the examples. But the biggest thing is setting up is that you're working to develop the infrastructure within the country that you're working. Um, so you're working with the partners on the ground to develop those, those systems that'll stay in place. Uh, another area um, that's very also very common is the humanitarian or disaster response. And so that leads to like the courses that Naz was talking about, like those, a lot of the groups that focus on that are the ones that also put those courses on. Um, this also can be an area where people will work a lot with refugees, um, whether that's working with refugees that are in, um, in the US and your local community or refugees, um, refugee set, uh, camps that are like, um, that are in another, uh, in another area, another country, um, people fleeing war, um, or disaster response, disaster, something like that. 
Another area is policy. Um, and so some groups will also work a lot with like big, um, big institutions. So like WHO or Ministry of Health in order to come up with like national level policy um, kind of things. The policy part can also kind of get mixed into a lot of the other stuff. Um, you don't, you can't really set up an EMS system without having some input from the Ministry of Health, for example. Um, so that kind of, that gets interwoven into a lot of the other areas. And then some of the groups are also very heavy into the research. Um, and so they're doing more clinical research or uh, more like what I consider more hardcore research as opposed to something that might be a little more soft. I am not a hardcore researcher. Um, and so it's a little, like it's one of those things that every group is a little different. And a lot of groups will have somebody like one, one or two people that are very researchy and other people are not. Um, so that's something to kind of think about when you're asking about the, what, uh, what the department looks like, what their section looks like. Another thing to consider is what the lifestyle is. Um, I personally really like shorter trips, like the two to four week type trips. That's the thing that makes me happy. But there are also, there are other people that wanna go somewhere and stay there for six months. Um, and different fellowships will be structured to do that differently. Um, some fellowships are going to be set up from a department staffing point where they prefer the shorter trips because it makes it easier to keep the rest of the department going um, to make sure that the clinical shifts are covered. Um, other departments are going to be like, they know that this is what the global EM people do is they work a lot the first year and then disappear their second year um, so that they can be abroad most of that time. Um, everybody's, it's all a little different. And some of this is also affected by what the requirements of an advanced degree are. Um, some advanced degrees are require a lot of in-person time at the beginning of the um, beginning of the program. And so that's just gonna change how your fellowship is structured um, because of that. And then you sprinkle in things like conferences, um, you try to attend the didactics uh, that Nas mentioned about um, like the monthly uh, um, didactic series, um, things like that. And then I'm just gonna give a very brief overview of like, as an example of what Stanford is. Um, I'm the co-fellowship director for Stanford. Um, and so uh, this is the one that I know very, very well, uh, obviously. Uh, and so for our program, we are two years. Our department chair has decided that she wants all our fellows to be two years. Um, so that is just a requirement. If you do not have an advanced degree, it is very strongly encouraged to get an advanced degree. Um, the department will pay $25,000 to, uh, per year for that degree. Uh, and it can be an MPH, it can be online, or it can be something else um, online, um, usually primarily online. Sometimes there's uh, like a week of in-person requirement, something like that. Like that's something that it was, we can work around. And as I said, I am somebody that likes short trips. That's something that Stanford generally does is like the two to four week trip time. Um, and so it could be two weeks of a teaching project, um, teaching EMTs in Nepal, for instance, and then another like main project being somewhere else. Um, we focus more on capacity building. Um, and so uh, we've been involved heavily in an EMS system in India, um, developing that. Um, and so we're, it's, we've been, it's a long-standing partnership. And so we still are working with um, kind of retraining EMTs, training new EMTs, um, and then also using our contacts with that EMS system to work on things like referral systems and getting patients, like how patients are getting moved from hospital to hospital. We also focus a lot on medical education. That's what I really like doing. And so, um, We've uh, worked setting up um, training like diploma courses in emergency medicine um, in Myanmar. We're also, um, that's an older project. We're also working on um, with a residency program in uh, Rwanda. Um, working currently, we just started a project working uh, to develop ultrasound training for that, um, for example. Um, that's kind of how like the different projects that we have active. Our fellows can work um, on any of those projects. They can come in with new project ideas, new context, and then bring it, bring it to us and we try to support them. Um, this is something where it, it is something where I would say like 
our strength is not the humanitarian disaster response part. That's something we can connect people if they want to like get a little bit of information on that, get a little experience with it. But it's not our strength to like set people up for that, um, to make that their main project, um, just as an example. Um, and then I am, I think that's all I had to say. I'm going to drop my email into the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me or put things into the chat. And then I think next up is Kristen. Thanks, Michelle. All right, I feel a little theme across all three of us. I have similar things to say <laughs> with you two, as you two. Um, but I'm going to share my screen real quick, just as a little guide. Uh oh, can you guys see that? Okay, I can't see everyone now though. You would think after doing Zoom teaching and Zoom everything for two and a half years, I don't know why, but I can't see you guys, but I can see my screen. All right. Um, so my name is Kristen DeTore. I am the Global Fellowship Director at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee. And I am old. Um, I completed residency in 2009 and was the first fellow at Vanderbilt. And so this is a little bit a little in the past when fellowships weren't as prevalent. And so I had the opportunity to be the guinea pig and try to help develop our fellowship program. Um, my main work is in Guyana, South America, where we have a longstanding partnership with Georgetown Public Hospital. We have a teaching program there, um, an emergency medicine residency program, some a critical care nursing program, and we've worked to develop EMS. And kind of like Michelle said, and Naz said, research is a component of things, but that is not my strong suit, but we are working to start implementing more research with our colleagues down there. Um, I'm so happy you guys are all here today. This is great. So um, please uh, stop me along the way if anybody has questions and everyone else just chime in if you have any input. So a couple of things we're going to talk about today is um, what makes you a strong or competitive applicant for a global fellowship? Um, and I think it goes without saying that a strong resident is going to be a strong applicant, just like a strong med student is going to be a strong residency applicant. And so we really want strong emergency medicine physicians that are clinically sound with their knowledge, their procedural skills, and their leadership skills. Um, I think Naz said this as well, but some of the characteristics and just personality traits that go well with a global fellowship is if you're flexible, adaptive, resourceful, and overall just likable. Um, you're going to be put in a lot of different situations with a lot of different people, and you're going to have to think and act on your feet and represent your home program. So I think that's really important to just have a pretty um, humble attitude and a humble personality going into this field. Um, and then I do believe this goes without saying, but having strong letters of recommendation is always super helpful. I think anytime you have a close uh, mentor or someone who has watched you progress through residency, that's a really good person to ask for a letter. It doesn't matter. I, I would prefer to see a very personal letter over a letter coming from a very well-known name, if that makes sense. So what do you do during residency to get ready? Um, if you happen to be at a, an academic center or a residency training program that has a global EM residency track, I think this is amazing. This is gonna get you directly involved with all the global work that that department's already doing. It's going to allow you to participate in these more longitudinal projects that are already ongoing and kind of get you on board and you can jump in right away. It also gives you really focused mentorship and guidance from people who are already working in the global setting. Um, and then it's nice if you can, everybody has to do an academic project or a scholarly project for residency. And if you can have a global focus to this, this is going to go a long way going forward. Now, not everybody is at a place that has a global EM track, and that is totally okay. Sometimes you just have to make your own way and try to figure out, kind of like Nas was saying and Michelle was saying, like figure out what you enjoy doing, whether that is teaching or systems development or EMS development. Um, research is always great, 
but what you like to do makes a big difference. And so once you know a, a little bit about what you want to do, you're going to seek out others and engage with other residents or faculty members who can help you make that happen. I think anytime you can do a clinical elective um, in a resource limited setting or some sort of international setting, that's going to go, um, it's going to give you a really unique experience and you'll probably take a lot away from it that will help guide what you want to do with your future. Um, especially if you have a certain population in, in, my, in mind or a location that you might be interested in working long term, I would try to go in that direction. Um, over the pandemic, I think Zoom has changed global emergency medicine and global work just tremendously. And we had to shift pretty quickly from doing everything on the ground with our colleagues in Guyana to doing everything by Zoom for two full years. So we used to have a faculty member or a fellow on the ground in Guyana every month, helping teach, train, uh, mentor, work in the emergency department. And we had to shift that completely. But I think that was actually a good thing because we've now had a lot of opportunities to get other people involved in teaching by Zoom. And so if this is something you have interest in doing, we have invited guest speakers to teach our residents in Guyana countless times. We teach every Tuesday. So our residents have taught them. We've had visiting residents from other programs. We've had visiting fellows. So if you have a residency lecture that you can teach, that's really wonderful as well. Sometimes you can't travel like during the pandemic. And if you are landlocked to the US, one way to kind of get your feet wet in this area is to work in a clinic where there's an underserved population or a refugee population. And that's just gonna depend on where you are, but pretty much every city is gonna have a clinic, um, an outreach clinic that you could get involved in. And that's just something you would like kind of work through at your own home program and figure out. Um, like Naz and Michelle both said, there are a ton of advanced courses that are um, offered in some fellowships, but if you can do any of these before you apply for a fellowship, it goes a long way. Um, the, the WHO BEC course is just a one-day course, and that is very feasible. It's very affordable, and it gives you the um, skills and just a certificate of being able to train others in basic emergency care. Those other courses are a little bit more time intensive and a tad bit more expensive. Um, but if you have a month elective and your program approves you to go do one of these courses, um, that would go, that would be great experience. And you can talk about it when you do, do your interviews and already have that in your back pocket as something you'd like to uh, help kind of share with others in your fellowship. Um, I asked a couple prior fellows, you know, what did you do to prepare for a fellowship or because I did this a long time ago <laughs> and I haven't prepared for fellowship in a long time. Um, and one of our fellows said, she said her biggest recommendation would be to just craft your CV towards global health. So take all those experiences you've done in med school and residency and really highlight those on your CV. So if you've had um, clinical experience working somewhere, research experience in global health, teaching with global health emphasis, highlight that in your CV any way you can. And then another big thing is if you've done some sort of educational or academic project already, how can that be something um, trainees and physicians from potentially a low resource setting access those projects or those materials? Or how can you adapt that for a low resource setting? So say you um, help develop like an HIV screening program for your own department, um, here at home, how can you adapt that to a low resource setting and implement that somewhere else? And then I think lastly, um, making a great impression with the people you're interviewing with is huge. And I think for me, one of the things I really appreciate is when um, an applicant has read about our program or read a little bit about the projects we're doing and really has an understanding of what our department and division is about and can ask pretty focused questions. So anytime you're um, gonna interview, research that program, 
If you know who you're interviewing with, see if they have a bio on their website that shows what their current projects are. And just think about ways that you could integrate yourself into that program. Like what strengths do you have that you can add to enhance their program? Um, and then I think also it, just expressing your own personal goals. Um, like Michelle was saying, each fellowship is really different. Um, and that's kind of nice. It gives you it gives you a big choice or a lot of choices of whether you want to do true like clinical on the ground work or more education focus or more research focused program. Every I think most of the programs have a similar basis, but you're going to have a different emphasis from program to program. And so knowing what you're interested in doing is really helpful going into it and it can avoid a lot of unnecessary interviews. I think that's about it. Do you guys have any, well, we're going to go to questions, but if anybody else wants to chime in, go for it. Perfect. No, thank you so much, uh, Drs. Kareem, Dr. Feltes, and uh, Dr. Jatori for um, starting us off on this webinar with that, those, um, those talks. I think it helped really set the stage and I think hopefully answer a lot of questions off the bat. Um, so I think what we want to do for the next portion, I think we've got about uh, 15, 20 minutes here. Um, we have a group of panelists here that include um, all of our speakers, as well as additional program directors and a couple current fellows and even um, uh, a resident who is applying this year as well, too, just to provide some different perspectives um, and answer your questions as well, too. So I'm going to open it up to the panelists to kind of introduce themselves in a popcorn fashion. And I'll start with Dr. Um, Sean Kivlihan, and then we'll open it up to questions um, after that. So feel free to unmute yourself um, or post something in the chat and I'll read those out to the to the panelists. Um, but before we do that, I do want to post um, the website for all the fellowships in the chat. So I'm doing that now. Just to note, though, this is an, a website that will be going away sometime in the next couple of months. So it's there right now for, for reference for all of you. It has um, pretty much all of the global emergency medicine fellowships that are out there. Um, so use it for reference, but just know um, SAM is actually building us a new website uh, that is due to go live in May. So use it right now for reference. Don't use it for any application materials, things like that. And then be sure to check out the new website that opens up um, in May um, for all the most up-to-date information as well as uh, stay tuned for another webinar that we're planning on hosting in June that'll give you more um, logistical information on how to apply this year with the new website uh, and the match and all of that. So um, then I think with that, we'll go ahead and have the panelists introduce themselves so we have some time for questions. So Dr. Kivlihan, take it away. Thanks, Megan. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Sean Kivlihan. I'm the Fellowship Director of Public Emergency Medicine at Brigham and Women's in Harvard in Boston. And um, as fellow myself, and um, also I'm the president of GEMA um, currently. Uh, thanks for, for joining in here to answer any questions. I'll pass it on to Nicole, who is one of our current fellows uh, right now. Hi, thanks, Sean. Um, hi, guys. I'm Nicole Michael Lee. I am the first year um, International Emergency Medicine Fellow at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I'm currently in Liberia. So sorry if my connection is bad. Um, my work is in um, emergency care development, um, doing some work in Kenya as well as Liberia, and then had the opportunity to travel to Ukraine this past fall as well. Um, and then I, sorry, I'm on a phone because of the internet situation here. So um, I'm going to popcorn it over, I think, Rama. Hey guys, I'm Rema. I'm one of the PGY3 residents at Mass General and Brigham and Women's. Um, I am applying for a fellowship this year, um, so very excited about that. Um, just here to provide a resident uh, perspective, and I will popcorn it to Nas. Hey guys, as you remember, I'm the fellowship director at Brown. Um, co-directing actually with uh, Kyle Martin. Um, so feel free to ask us any questions uh, about Brown and. I'll then popcorn it to Orion, who's one of our fellows. Hi, my name is Orion Longerstam, one of the two first year fellows at Brown. Um, my interests are emergency care development. I'm gonna be working in Armenia to develop their emergency medicine residency. I'm also doing work in Rwanda with a mass casualty disaster training. I don't know who needs to go next. <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, Michelle, if you wanted to reintroduce yourself real quick, and then Kristen, and then I think we'll be good to open it up for questions. I'll read the first question from the chat after that. Awesome. Uh, so again, I'm Michelle Feltis. 
I'm fellowship co-director at Stanford, did my fellowship at Stanford as well. Um, and I'm the chair elect for GMFC. Uh, so um, we're taking over for Megan in a few months. And I'm Kristen DeTore. I am the fellowship director at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee. And I did fellowship here, residency here, and I'm originally from Ohio, but probably sticking around here in Tennessee. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much to all the panelists for being here and to all of you in the audience for being here as well, too. So let's open it up for questions. I'll start with the first one that was posted in the chat. Uh, many thanks to all the speakers. I would love to hear about a potential path which an emergency physician trained from a low resource setting would take to do a global EM fellowship. Is this something you've seen happen before? Most of the global EM fellows I have seen mostly come from high resource settings. Excellent question. Um, any one of our panelists want to take that? I could start. Um, I think that's a really interesting and awesome question. Um, because that rarely occurs. And I think it we need to have a greater opportunity for that to, to happen. Um, I would say, I'm just gonna speak for Brown because I know that that's what's offered here, but you know, any of the other fellowships can um, make remarks as well. But uh, at Brown, there is an opportunity to have an observership, which is not the same as a fellowship, but that is sort of like an exchange program um, in specifically in Rwanda, but really it's open to any country um, where they can come observe uh, be a part of the educational curriculum, watch and shadow in the emergency department, be a part of the didactic series and journal club, um, and take part in pretty much all the activities that occur without formally training in emergency medicine and putting hands on patients in the emergency room. Um, and that is definitely a possibility. I think our institution would be open to a global fellowship like that. So feel free to reach out to us. I'm not sure what um, other groups here, if they have opportunities as well. I was gonna say, I can speak. Um, so we have a similar program. Our second year residents from Guyana all come to Van, oh baby, <laughs> um, all come to Vanderbilt and do a month of observership. Um, but we actually had one of our Guyanese graduates express interest in doing a global EM fellowship. And so I've been working with him to develop that to see what that would actually look like. Um, a lot of that is a little bit difficult based on what your degree, like where you can practice medicine with your degree. Um, but you can work around that. Our thoughts were for him is we were going to develop a fellowship where he works in the hinterlands, which is like the mountains and um, rainforests in Guyana. And so he was going to do just basically working in a very, very low resource setting, doing teaching and clinical care um, and also doing some tropical medicine training. So I think that is just such a good question. It is it's definitely doable. It just takes a little bit of creativity to make it happen and money. Um, it's hard to get your chair to give you money to support others when that isn't bringing something into your home program, but it's 100% worth it. So we're figuring out a plan. Uh, I can uh, say my perspective on this too. And I, and sorry, I have a special guest here who sees all the people on the screen and she wants to be part of the action. So it is possible to do global health with children, um, <laughs> but it is more, more challenging, but possible. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, um, oh geez, sorry. So so my, my thoughts on this are that it has to do with funding as Kristen just said, which is the biggest barrier. Um, so like, for example, the, the model that we use for our global EM fellow at Brigham, they need to be able to work clinically in our emergency department to make the fellowship viable. It's a requirement. Um, and to work clinically in our emergency department and for most emergency departments at any academic medical center in the US, you need to be ABEM eligible. So, so you, you need to either be already certified by the American Board of Emergency Medicine or eligible to sit for those boards, which means that general most of the time means that you completed a residency in either the US or Canada. So that is the biggest limitation we find for people who are non-US Canada origin um, applying for our fellowships. Um, that there are alternatives, alternatives, and there, there's there's variations of fellowships that are done. There are non-clinical fellowships. There's research fellowships. There's administrative fellowships. Um, we have a simulation fellowship that is uh, global oriented, that's non-clinical, 
And these these fellowships, you can have people from anywhere in the world because they don't have to work clinically. That's always the barrier is being able to work clinically in, in the hospital. Um, also, there's op many opportunities with large NGOs um, to work abroad in with um, some participation in the U.S. So, like Partners in Health has some has uh, some programs, and other large NGOs have educational programs where people can rotate out. So, there's definitely opportunities there. But I'll say, for like as we talk about GEM fellowships in the concept of going through the NRMP match and this, most of those fellowships require the person to work clinically. And that becomes the biggest barrier of the structure of the fellowship. So we should look at other models to complement that and be more inclusive. Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, I just want to add like another thing that it could be called is something like a postdoc um, idea that it's um, that's something that we've had people do um, where they're really doing more research. Um, they're not, it's not a clinical fellowship. Um, there's, so there's no clinical duties like uh, Sean was talking about, like that's the biggest barrier. Um, so it may not be called quite the same thing, but it doesn't mean that it's not possible, um, that there's another way to get the same, a lot of the same education and experience. So. Great, um, I hope that answers the question. Um, let us know if you have any follow-up questions uh, regarding that. But um, with that, I'll move on to the next one. Um, what should a PGY-1 versus a like PGY-2 or 3 resident um, be doing to prepare for fellowship applications? Uh, I'm gonna say a PGY-1 should be focused on surviving PGY-1 year, uh, in my opinion. Um, I think if you have, like that, that's the biggest thing, I think for a uh, PGY-1. Um, like, like Naz said, like our biggest, like our biggest thing, uh, Naz and uh, Kristen both said this, like we want good ER doctors, like that's our biggest ask. And so if you spend too much of your time as an intern trying to do all these other things, um, it can get really hard to actually get the skills that you need clinically, or you're going to burn out. <laughs> um, like both of those, I think are very, like, those are both things that I don't want really anybody to do. Um, so I think if you have global EM uh, faculty at your residency, as an as a PGY one, I would just start talking to people. Like I wouldn't try to get on projects. I would just start making the contacts, so that as you become a PGY two or three, you can start working on those, um, working on those, developing those projects. Um, if you have the option for electives, like planning for future electives as a two or three. Um, would be um, to be able to spend your time abroad, it would be great. Um, but as a PGA one, just survive it. And I, I would totally agree. I love that. <laughs> I probably would not have thought of that. Um, I would also say um, like connecting with those global faculty members or other um, residents or fellows who are already doing projects, making that connection your first year. And also they, um, I think our, our program, the resident schedule is made pretty far in advance. And so figuring out when your electives are going to be and potentially arranging to travel um, to do a global elective with one of the faculty members, we, we have to supervise just getting them oriented down there. And so just starting that coordination, maybe at the end of your first year to know when you want to go do a global elective, that's helpful. Um, for your second year, for sure, and getting on a project, like starting to work on a project then. I would say there's like certain categories that, you know, when I see an applicant that we're looking for, which is clinical skills, like Kristen was mentioning, um, leadership skills, uh, communication and professionalism, um, just even during an interview, uh, you know, I would say we're a little bit more researchy, <laughs> like Kristen was saying, um, but it's not the end all be all. And you don't have to have this like massive research background because part of the most of the fellowship really for us is learning how to do that. Um, so you don't really have to have a big background in it. And so you shouldn't be scared to apply if that's not in your CV. Um, but just even like showing interest in global EM by being involved in GEMA, being involved in EMRA International, um, you know, GEMS LP, those types of groups uh, says a lot as an applicant and, um, uh, you know, making, making sure that, as Michelle mentioned, getting networking done in the first year, but then maybe just involving yourself in one project, maybe two if you can handle it. 
um, in your second and third year. And if your institution doesn't have a global track, then connecting with a group that does so you can, you know, like say you don't have a global track, but I have a lot of people connect to me and say, I don't have a global track. I'm a resident. Can I hop on a project of yours? And then we figure that out. So um, kind of networking in that way. Just echo some of what's said. The number one priority that I look for in applicants is that they are going to be strong clinically. Um, because if you need to be able to do do this work, you need to be able to be exceptional at home. Being an average ER doctor isn't enough because you're going to be balancing your time with traveling and all those other requirements. So, um, so focus on becoming the best ER doctor you can be. You only have one opportunity to learn how to be a great ER doctor, um, and that's residency. So, and it goes by quicker than you think. So focus on that. And then at the same time, as Naz is just saying, you know, start making connections um, you don't, and just networking. So intern year, you should be engaging mentors. If there's people doing global health work at your department, you should be meeting with all of them. Just cold email them and try to get coffee with them or something. They'll find the time. But just to pick their brain and get your, get your name on their radar. Um, and then um, if there's not people in your department, then look outward. Look at your hospital. Look at other departments. And maybe the med Department of Medicine, Department of Surgery. And even further still, your university system. So there's almost always people doing it. And if you're there, just cold email and explain it and meet with people, just build that network. And then utilize uh, things like this, SAM, GEMA. Also, um, so EMRA has great uh, opportunities for residents to get involved if you don't have mentorship locally. RAMS at SAM. Um, and you know, then there's CUGH, IFAM, AAM. I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's all mostly free or low cost for residents. And so just get, just reach out. But Nobody's going to come looking for you. You need to go go get it. Yeah, I think Emma has like a list of mentors too, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a yeah. I, I this is like my conflict of interest moment here with the SAM webinar, GMA president, but also in my ASAP hat, which is unrelated. Um, yes, there is uh, the Gems LP program, which. Um, which uh, is a shameless plug I'll be presenting at this Monday night. So so come, <laughs> so we can send you a phrase for that. But I'm a big proponent of, you know, we're all in this together. And SAM and ASAP, um, uh, I don't know who's here, Holly or, or one of but cover your ears. But, you know, they're here to, to help us. And and so use them and to, to network and advance your careers. Also, the SAM Fellowship Fair. I'm not sure what's the date on that. Well, I'll look that up. But um, that's going to be occurring where you can network um, as well as the GEMA uh, dating table, like mentorship table, really, it's not a dating table, mentorship table that occurs is a great way to meet uh, mentors. And that's going to be at SAM 23. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And that is the SAM again this year, I forget the exact date. Um, but it's a I think the 17th of May, for some reason, is in my mind. Um, but it's great, and residents should really attend that and medical students. And I've met, uh, it happens every year. And I've, I've met more than one uh, current or past fellow there first. It was my first time meeting them. So it's definitely a worthwhile, worthwhile use of your time. Uh, I wanna add to, to that, like the mentorship and connections are great. We like, we're not gonna go looking if you reach out to us. Um, the vast majority are going to be open to having people on their projects, but it also means we are not gonna be chasing you down. Um, so if you reach out to us once and we email you back and you don't respond, we are not going to email you again in general. Um, so that's something just to keep in mind, like if you are looking outside your institution for that mentorship um, and those connections, like make sure you're extra responsive. Um, it'll make the process much, much smoother for um, both sides. All right. Um, I think we're just about out of time. We have just a couple of uh, minutes left. Um, there is one other question, but I'd also like to hear just a quick one or two lines um, from the current fellows and their experiences, kind of their lessons learned. Um, so let me read off this question. I don't know if you want to speak to either one of you want to speak to this, but um, in developing a niche in global emergency medicine, such as PEM or ultrasound, how do you recommend going about wanting to do a global EM fellowship as well as developing expertise through fellowship in a particular area? So I don't know if either one of the current fellows wants to kind of talk about how they're developing their niche or just kind of give their, their general experience so far, and then we'll wrap it up. I can talk about how I'm developing my niche. Unfortunately, neither one of them is PEM or ultrasound. I feel like those are just separate fellowships in themselves usually, but um, so I uh, decided I wanted to go into global health pretty, God, pretty uh, 
early in residency, but I was a COVID resident, so I feel like the mentorship opportunities of going to uh, conferences and travel were just non-existent. So um, I, now that I'm able to do those, I absolutely understand the value of meeting people in person. Um, it's a it's a huge opportunity and absolutely wonderful. I um, kind of fell into my niche a little bit. I'm um, Armenian originally, and so I've kept in touch with a faculty member at another institution who's also Armenian, and um, I'm in, I've always been interested in education, and I'm also interested in humanitarian work. And as I kept in touch, she said, well, actually, Armenia doesn't have any emergency medicine training. Would you be interested in like helping me out a little bit? And now it's turned out to we are developing the entire postgrad fellowship curriculum and later a residency. So my little project turned into probably what's going to be my life's work. But um, I think what was what's actually great is I have fantastic faculty at Brown who are helping me develop the skills that I need, but also supporting me in exploring my interests even outside the institution, um, which it's a small community and it's very supportive. And I think that's the huge benefit of fellowship is being able to explore a bit of everything until you find your your area. And from what I understand, people even find their area after fellowship. So really, it's just a good time to develop skills. Like I was not good quantitatively, and I knew I needed the MPH, and I want to get better at writing. And Kyle is like, well, here's some papers you can jump on and just learn to write. And so you really have a great structured system to get better at certain things and the time to do it. So don't want to take too long, Nicole. Go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, so my my area of interest is in uh, development, primarily in medical education. So I got involved with that um, as a resident at Brown, actually working on medical education through the basic emergency care course uh, for medical students in Kenya. And then I've continued that and I came into fellowship with already having my MPH and so have like crafted my own kind of educational plan um, in taking other courses while I'm a fellow. So I am taking courses like a health educator courses through the Harvard Macy Institute um, to become a better educator so that I can craft the curriculum that I'm teaching in Liberia. So like kind of putting all of that into practice um, and then just sort of focusing on other educational courses during fellowship that I think will make me a better educator. Like I'm hoping to take the Gorgas course so that I can actually teach about tropical diseases when I because I don't have a background in that. Um, so that's sort of the focus. I started doing it in residency and then I've continued the work and expanded to other locations and really trying to like dive in and um, as a medical educator, like learn how to educate people the best way possible. Hi everyone. My name's Mary, I'm a Hopkins first year fellow. Sorry, tried to introduce myself earlier, had technical difficulties. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with all the networking to find your niche and just kind of jumping in on different projects. Um, but I also wanted to add that um, I do agree fellowships are a really good time to explore different areas. Um, and you might think like, oh, I really want to do ultrasound. Um, and then you find a passion for humanitarian medicine or it just kind of changes. And I think getting the MPH and networking with um, a bunch of experts really kind of helps um, drive your path. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And sorry, Mary, you're labeled as your phone number, so we didn't know it was you. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, I had some technical problems, but. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, I th think that we are at time. Um, so again, I just want to say thank you so much to our speakers today, to all of our panelists, um, to SAAM for, for hosting this. Uh, a special thank you to Rama for helping with all of the advertising out there. Um, and with that, I think any one of the folks um, that were speaking here today would love to answer questions at any point. And I know most of them have put their emails in the chat. So um, thank you guys so much. Um, and we'd love to hear from you in the future. And stay tuned again for our next webinar, um, hopefully coming up in June about how to apply. So thank you guys so much. <laughs>